good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to the last day of our conference. Um, today we have uh, John Stokes from Ars Technica speaking about digital humanities. Um, so, and about why there's a waste of time, and he, he proposes a method to fix them. So, please welcome John Stokes. Thank you. I, I actually have to um, to apologize for the title. Uh, the the title was. Uh, kind of a tongue-in-cheek thing, you know, if you go to a, a conference, especially a humanities conference like the MLA or the an SBL, Society of Biblical Literature Conference, um, probably 90% of the papers could really be called why what everybody else does is a waste of time and why you should all listen to me and do things the way that I say. So Witt was um, pestered me in email, he wanted a title, he wanted an abstract. <laughs> and so this is what I kind of half-jokingly uh, sent him um, I hope that it doesn't come back to haunt me. Uh, and I, it's also the title was a kind of a, a goad to, I, I know that there's a digital humanities community here on the campus. John Unsworth is the dean of the, um, uh, I think the Graduate uh, School of Library and Information Sciences. And so he's just really huge in the digital humanities field. And I'll talk a little bit about what that is, because you guys may not know so much about it, or maybe, maybe some of you do. So the idea was that you know, um, people in the DH community would like see this title and go, oh, I have to go to this guy's talk so that I can laugh at him and like, you know, harass him with questions afterwards. So uh, that, was, that was kind of the impetus behind the title. Um, the, uh, I mean, I have to say ahead of time, I, I went through a lot of material. and. So part of the part of the the, uh, the the challenge of this talk is to talk about um, uh, things digital and you know things analog and old. Now mo most of you guys know me as a microprocessor geek and as somebody who writes about um, you know microprocessors for Ars Technica and as kind of an, an engineer type person. <coughs> I actually uh, in my in my day job. Um, well, ours really is my day job. Um, in my uh, my other my other day job, I'm a, a historian, and I started out. I did um, I did an undergrad in, in engineering, and then I did an MDiv, a Master's of Divinity, and I did early church history, and so I did a lot of Greek and a lot of Hebrew, and then I did a THM, which is a, a Master of Theology, which is basically just another year tacked on, and I did more ancient stuff. And so now at the University of Chicago. Um, I'm studying under a uh, Paul scholar, uh, Margaret Mitchell, um, not the person who wrote Gone with the Wind, but the person who wrote Paul and the Rhetoric of Reconciliation about 1 Corinthians. Anyway, so, uh, so I'm a PhD student there, and uh, Mitchell is a really interesting person because there, there's a, a manuscript digitization project called the Goodspeed uh, Manuscript Digitization Project. And so that's at the, um, that's, she's, that, that's being run out of the University of Chicago Library. And so they have this manuscript collection and they're digitizing it. And they're trying to find a way to make it presentable and accessible online. And so typically um, throughout my graduate career, the past 10 years of my graduate career, I've really kept the, um, a, a pretty strict wall between the, uh, oh, I had this little slide here, um, between the Divinity School side of my, my biography and the R side of my biography. And there's a, the main reason for that is if people at Divinity School find out that you know about computers, then you immediately are like ghettoized as one of these computer people who can, you know, maybe come fix their Mac or something like this, and they don't really take you that seriously as a as a, uh, a historian. Well, <laughs> I finally decide that the situation is untenable because I'm only one person, and you can only go so far doing two things. I kind of feel like um, this guy here, um, the famous Flash of the Two Worlds cover. You know, and so that's that's uh, on one side is um, humanities John, and on another side is uh, Ars Technica John, and you know we're trying to save this kid from being hit by a uh, well, I don't know. Anyway, um, so so I do not, however, feel like this guy. But um, anyway, he was he, he he may or may not make an appearance in the talk. Um, so I, I got involved in this project, and I, I didn't really get involved involved in it. Um, because right now they're just kind of scanning things. And they're scanning things and they're putting them online. And so what I wanted to do was to investigate the field as a place where I could like marry these two types or these two sides of my, 
um, of myself and like maybe make a real contribution because I, I read, um, uh, well, let, let me back up. So, so five months ago, I, I started going through all of this literature in this field, digital humanities. And there's all these different kinds of areas um, in digital humanities. Lots of, I mean, it's, it's really, there's a debate as to whether it's even a discipline. Um, and I read all of this stuff. I mean, there's, there's using computational linguistics to do authorship studies. There's um, uh, building archives online. Um, there's uh, just like all, all kind of different, all kind of different projects that people are doing that, that kind of fuse uh, humanities with the computer. And so as I read back through about 20 years of this literature and journal articles and posts and uh, old, actually old mailing list posts, I would go back and read some of those. Um, that's what's actually great. Um, in, in 100 years, uh, everything that you do um, is going to be on your you're like your track through the internet will, will be accessible somehow to historians. I mean, you should think about that. Um, seriously, especially you guys that are younger. The stuff that you write, the stuff that you blog, the stuff that you post, my counterpart in a hundred years, if you, if you are fortunate enough to become somebody who merits scholarly study, is going to go back and mine the internet and find that thing that you wrote at 3 in the a.m. when you were really mad and like you were in your boxers and like this guy had just made you furious and you fired it off onto the internet and it's going to be there into perpetuity. So, uh, so this is the kind, of, the, kind of, the kind of thing that I did, and it was a lot of fun. And I, I read these texts as a humanist, um, a, a humanist meaning a humanity scholar, not somebody that Rush Limbaugh hates, um, but as, as a humanist and as an engineer. And a, a couple of things started to pop out at me, especially, um, especially the engineering side of my brain. So... I started to notice that there was a certain way that um, scholars would talk about, um, especially digital humanities people, would talk about the computer, would talk about the projects they were working on. One of the first things that you actually notice is that when you go and use most of these projects, they're all in an alpha phase, they're all in a beta phase, um, and you read the publications that accompany the projects, uh, they, there's these great visions of what's going to happen and how everybody's world is going to be totally rocked and it's going to be revolutionary and all this other kind of stuff. And so then you go and you actually click on the website and it looks like some more stuff that's on the internet. I mean, you can go and find pictures of, you know, um, the moon on the internet. You can find pictures of midgets on the internet. You can find pictures of scanned in manuscripts on the internet. And so whenever you come to one of these, one of these digital archives, um, if you're, a, if you're a, a hypermedia kind of person, and I think most of, most of you are um, at your age, um, you, uh, you just see some more stuff that's on the internet. Um, but then you read the rhetoric of the papers and what all this stuff is supposed to do and what it's going to do and what it could do in 10 years. And... I, uh, I began to notice a pattern of speaking that uh, I guess you could call, I mean, the official term for this kind of language, you might call it hype. Um, but hype is kind of mean, and it doesn't really get at the point. And so I invented my own term for this, uh, which is, let me flip through a couple of slides here, which I put in the back. Yeah, um, the technological subjunctive. Um, subjunctive is a grammar term um, that, that you, it's a mode of speaking where you speak about a wish um, or speak about the future, what could happen, what should happen, what may happen. And so I have this definition of the technological subjunctive as um, it's, a, it's a grammatical mood that expresses a wish for a feature or that suggests the possibility of a feature or a whole category of features that the speaker is either not prepared to or not capable of paying someone to implement. That is the technological subjunctive. Now, now you guys are laughing because you know about the technological subjunctive. Um, typically, uh, this kind of language is the domain of the marketing department um, or, you know, possibly management. But <laughs> it's also the, the language of a humanities guy who uh, has been working on all these theories of, you know, the desidered text and the this text and the that text, and then they click on a hyperlink and it blows their mind. And they think of all these possibilities all of these different ways that you could use this great technology to just like 
um, well, just do anything. You're not really quite sure what you could do with it, but it's going to be cool. And you know, you come up with a set of ideas, and based on uh, what people could or should or might be able to do, and then you think, well, I'm not a programmer. Um, I'm a, I'm a content guy. I'm not a um, I'm not a, like a, an information architecture guy. And so my job is to supply content for journals or to edit content. And so how can I contribute to this explosion that's happening? And so you come up with a project, maybe it's a digital archive like the Perseus project, um, which is a, a, one of the really successful uh, examples of this, or the Rossetti archive um, out of the University of Virginia, um, which uh, John Unsworth was, a, I think, an early collaborator on with Jerome McGann. And you, um, you build this, and you put all this work into SGML coding, and you, mark, you tag places and names, and you put pictures um, up there, and you do all this stuff, and you have all this information. And then you look at it, and it's some stuff that's on your computer screen, and you click through it. And it's always like, um, compared to the model that you've envisioned in your mind for the future, and for how things are going to be you know, in the year 2000, or something, you know, if you've seen the Conan O'Brien skit, you know, um, you, uh, it's, it's never there. It's not quite there. Like, it's always version, you're, you're always a version like 0.5 or, or maybe 0.9, and you're really thinking about version 2.0 of this and what version 2.0 could look like. So you're building something in the now that's based on an invisible model that doesn't yet exist. It's based on, um, it's based on something that you can't see, and it's based on a projection that you've made of where technology is going to go. Um, you can get very rich doing that if, you, if, you're, if you're out in the private software industry where many of you will go and <laughs> you take this kind of gamble where you, you look for trends or trajectories and you, you plot them out um, two or three years in the future and you identify some kind of space or some kind of market and you build something that fits that and then if you hit the jackpot then it's like cha-ching, you know. But the, you, have to, you have to be somebody that's willing to like gamble on that. But, you can't necessarily run an academic discipline that way. Do you know what I'm saying? A a an academic discipline, it, 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 runs in a, it runs on a different kind of discourse. Humanity scholars um, and scholars in general, they're, they're craftspeople. And they look backwards, typically, towards older models. There's, a, there's the notion of the canon in the humanities. And you have these, um, these, these splendid arguments, uh, these texts, these um, uh, paintings or sculptures or something, and these exist in the past, and you learn to imitate them as you go through your apprenticeship in the, in the academic humanities guild. And you learn to produce stuff that's like the things that you know, but that fits the present moment and the present conversation. Because scholarship is ultimately in the humanities, it's a conversation. Um, that, that we're all having, and it just keeps changing. Uh, there's really, I don't think, I, I don't think there's any progress in, um, progress in the engineering or in the sciences sense um, in the human disciplines and in, the, and in man's study of man. Do you see what I'm saying? It's, it's totally 100% reflexive. Um, when, you, when, you study the hum, when you study objects of human culture, um, the, the only progress is when you dig something new up out of the ground. But the, um, the humanist, as a, as, or the historian as a historian, is actually always still like this guy because um, you, you're, uh, now Flash is modeled on the Greek god Hermes, um, from which we get the term hermeneutics, or um, the, the, uh, the Greek word for to translate is her hermenevo, um, I translate. And you know, he's got the little wings on his feet. And Hermes is the guy that goes in between two places. Um, he's always perpetually in transit. He's always in perpetually in transit in between these two different worlds. And so the historian is always in transit between the past and the present. So it's only with the digital age, and especially the PC and the democratization of digital technology, that you get this cast of, of historians and of humanists that are kind of perpetually in transit between the invisible future and the present instead of the invisible past and the present. And they're always trying to take the future and mediate it into the present. Um, but that, uh, 
that's really hard to do. I mean, just ask Intel, you know. I mean, they're uh, currently involved in all these different kinds of ways to see into the future, and they're, they're, they're playing that game, right? Intel is a company, is just one company that's playing that game, that has this, they have anthropologists that go out into the field and study how people use their cell phones in Africa. They have um, all these different initiatives and research initiatives, and they publish papers, because they're just trying to look through the fog of war on the map um, just, just a year or two out so that they can build something that fits that context. But um, I want to go back to this notion of, instead of a technology, of scholarship as a craft and a discipline that's one, that's conversational, and two, that's very anchored in a material and a physical context, and that's anchored in a media context. And I want to paint this picture of scholars through the ages as people who take these tools, um, you know, paper or computers or whatever kind of tools that they have at their disposal, and they learn to use them to make these, these conversational cultural objects that are, A, they're modeled on something that, they're modeled on the best examples of, of previous generations. And, and so you've got one eye on the past, and you've got another eye on the current, the current context. And so that actually, to, to go to this guy, um, let me flip back through here. These slides are just not really in a, that much of an order here, so my apologies. That is a techne. Um, uh, Greek, the Greek word for techne, art, skill, cunning of hand. This is from the LSJ. This is from the um, Liddell and Scott lexicon. Um, an art or a craft, a set of rules, a system, or method of making or doing, whether the useful arts or the fine arts. And um, examples of this in ancient Greece would have been shipbuilding. Uh, where you built a, um, a new ship um, you know, on commission from, from an emperor or something like this, based on uh, previous models of what worked in use. Uh, people were using this ship technology, and they were building ships and making ships, and certain things worked and certain things didn't. Maybe um, the other guy uh, found a way to speed his ships up, and so you need to find a way to speed your ships up. And so in the context of use, you tweak, you refashion, you put it out there, people use it, then they take it again based on that, 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 that tweaked thing, it becomes a model. It, beco it, it joins the canon if it's successful. And then future craftsmen take that idea, that model, and they tweak it further in the course of use, like based on the demands of the moment, and they make something new. And you guys can see how this is the opposite of the model of projection, where you look at what may happen, at a space of what may happen, and you try to build so that when inevitability catches up, you have something that fits that, that context. This is the opposite. This is, this is a slow, um, and I hate to call it evolution, because evolution has a sense of inevitability about it. It's the collective result. Um, this evolution is a result of a collection of decisions by human actors. Uh, things didn't have to, to evolve the way that they did um, from, say, from the scroll to the handwritten book to the printed book um, to the web document. Um, things didn't necessarily have it, it's not like there was an inevitability to that. So, 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 so much for techne. Let's talk about um, let's talk about Plato for a second because I want to uh, I, I want to make a <coughs> I want to make a point and, and let me just let me try to keep the main point of view. And the main point of view is um, why uh, why it's a bad idea for an academic discipline to try and make things based on somebody's projection of five or ten years out and try to, um, to revolutionize why, why it's a bad idea for, for somebody who comes from the, this world of the humanities to try and revolutionize the way that we all do uh, X, Y, or Z on the internet. Do you know what I'm saying? You have to leave that decision to the market because the market's the only thing that's going to vote and decide that this is a success or it's not a success. Nobody in their study is, um, well, let me back up. Um, again, too, uh, too much material, <laughs> I'm trying to like filter. So, uh, so at any rate, one of the things that, you know, okay, Plato was an important guy, and he was important not just because he had a huge in a world historical intellect, but because he had that intellect at a time when writing was really coming into its own. And he kind of took this medium 
that uh, was a second class citizen in this oral culture. And he made it a vehicle for the kind of scholarly dialogue that he had participated in, um, in his training under Socrates. Um, all of these guys are sitting around and they're sitting around at the Stoa or wherever it is that they're hanging out in Epicurus's garden and they're talking to each other about uh, fundamental things, about the nature of reality, about um, how things got to be the way that they are. Uh, they're, they're trying to, um, they're talking about how good, you know, good government, how do you educate your citizens. All these social problems, political problems, scientific problems, they're working out in this oral medium. Now, at the time, you, you have lots of people writing things. Aristophanes has written his plays um, a little bit before this. Um, Thucydides has written histories, um, Herodotus. You have people writing down all kinds of different things. And so writing is not new, but writing is secondary. And writing is secondary the way that, say, the web was secondary in 1993 when I first got on it. You know, I lived my life and I went around campus and I did stuff and I talked to people and I had, um, you know, uh, B squared logic that I made my little uh, circuit, circuits with and, you know, um, uh, 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 Symantec C compiler and, you know, this is the, the kind of stuff of, of the John undergraduate life. And then periodically I would go by the library and get on a Unix terminal and I would use the Lynx browser and the Pine, um, the Pine uh, email client and I would do some stuff online. Um, this is writing for these guys. These guys don't live in a text-based culture. They don't live in a written culture. Most writing that they're going to see is something on the order of this right here. Um, this is uh, Augustus's uh, res gest res gest Augusti, the, the um, acts, the deeds of the divine Augustus, the deified Augustus. Um, it's, it's public statuary. It's a monument. It's written in all capitals. And it has these nice serifs that come from when you, when you carve out um, the capital letters into the stone. So a scroll in this period um, is an, kind of an imitation of that in a certain way. Um, the earlier scrolls use a half uncial script. That means kind of like a reduced capital script. And they are um, a scroll like if you... If you're somebody in this period, it's like your, your primary experience of writing is on monuments like this and on tombstones, places in the public square. And <coughs> then you take this and you have a, um, a kind of portable version of this, which you can roll and unroll. And you always read these things aloud. And this is actually really important. People don't read silently until like the post-Civil War era. I mean, it's really remarkable. Everybody reads aloud in this period. You have to read aloud to be able to understand uh, what's being said. Reading silently is actually its own separate skill. And um, you, uh, you can't, um, you know how, like, I, I don't know how many of you are musicians, but if you, if you are a musician and you look at a music score, um, you've got to be really good to read a music score silently and to know what's going on. You have to be really good. Um, that's about how these guys were with a text like this. You always read it aloud. Um, and so there was always a voice. There was always a voice. These texts weren't silent. When you, when you had a scroll and you read a scroll, there was always a voice that spoke out of the scroll. And it was the voice of somebody else, the person who had first uttered that and, and had it transcribed. Either they transcribed it or a slave transcribed it. And so you always heard a voice um, when you used a scroll. These are some guys using scrolls. Now, this is an illumination from the Elizabeth Day McCormick Apocalypse. This is a kind of a, a later Greek codex, and I just cropped this out. Um, I just, I, I did this, um, just as a side note, I did this, all, all these slides with stuff that I could find online. That was kind of my rule. I only wanted to use digital objects that I found online. And I had a really hard time finding what I wanted online. And this is kind of part of the problem with the, the state of digital humanities, is you can't find things. Um, you can't find uh, exactly what you want. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But um, so these guys are using scrolls. And you can see that you, you roll it up and down like this. And a scroll, um, it holds a, what I would call like a sequentially developing logos. So logos is the Greek word for a speech. You can use it for an argument. You can use it for a word, except it's not technically just a word. It's a thing that's uttered, a thing that's said. 
Um, and in this sense, the scroll is like an analog tape. You scrub backwards and forwards with it, um, and you read aloud, and you hear it, or your slave does that and reads aloud while you take notes. Um, <coughs> there's no chapters or verse marks. There's no page numbers, because there are no pages. It's this sequential thing. It's not indexed the way that a page is. It's not chopped off the way that a page is. So you rely on memory, and you rely on memory of, of a voice that you hear when you read. Um, oh, let me get my uh, notes for the scroll here. So th this is kind of the the, uh, the experience of you of using a scroll. Um, you, you read it by gradually spooling it from the top to the bottom. Um, once you've read it, it's the coils are reversed. You've got to re-spool it the other direction. Um, it, the maximum cap capacity is really limited. I mean, you can fit maybe about a, maybe a dialogue of Plato, one of the substantial dialogues of Plato or Book of Thucydides on here. Um, it's, a, it's a set of pages, of papyrus pages, that are glued together end to end. And so there is a page, but it's not a page like we think of a page. You, you, scrolls don't, I mean, they don't have pages. It's just that those are the, that's the material. Um, and so you write across these pages that are spooled in these blocks. And if you want to reread something, you have to scroll back up to it. If you want to, um, to cite something, you have to cite it by the first line. Uh, if you want to quote somebody, typically you quote it from memory. Because how do you stack these things? You have to roll them all up. Then you put a tag on the end that says what's in the scroll. Then you stack them on a shelf. Um, it's not really that convenient to store. It doesn't hold much information. The cost per bit is really, is really poor. So it's poor storage density, high cost per bit, and it's not indexed. And so there's no random access, is my point. You can't do random, you can't do random access with these. It's all, all the access is sequential. Um, the, the effect of this is that you um, oh, well, the, well, actually, the other the other thing that I want to say is that if you want to if you want to make notes on a particular a particular text or a particular point in the text, you have to put a little mark, some kind of critical sign, next to the uh, next to one of the lines, and then you you make another scroll and you write down uh, what you wanted to say in the other scroll, and so the conversation is actually separated um, in, from the source text. If you want to like to write a commentary then you can't package that commentary with the, um, the source text, and you can't link the two together. Remember that I said scholarship is a mediated conversation. It's a conversation that takes place in and through media. And so one of the impacts that this has on scholarship in this period is that the conversation doesn't really persist that well, because you can, uh, you can lose the commentary, but you don't want to lose your copy of Homer, because it's, you know, it's your only copy. Or you don't want to lose your copy of Thucydides. And so you get these... Uh, scrolls with these marginalia, these marginal notes, and you don't have the commentary that they link to. There's no way to go from the source text to the relevant commentary. Uh, now, when you get to the codex, which is our modern book form, and this is just a page of a codex, it's a, it's a superior archival medium. Um, you can stack these. Um, you can uh, stack them with the spine out so that you can see what's on the spine. Um, you can, uh, it's more durable uh, because you're making it out of parchment, not papyrus. Um, the storage density is much better because you can write on both sides of the page. The cost per bit is higher or, or, or is lower, I mean, because you can, uh, you can actually fit <coughs> multiple scrolls into a book in this period. And so, it's like much more compact, and so you can almost, it's almost like a library between two covers. You fit multiple scrolls. You're still reading aloud, though. You're still reading aloud. You're still reading the source text aloud. And so one of the, th so the first, the first thing that happens, the first thing that happens, and this is important, um, when you move from codex to scroll is the first, the first codexes are just chopped up scrolls. It's like somebody took a scroll and they cut the pages up, and they, they stacked them. And they stored them that way. So it's not like, um, well, we had a scroll, and now we have this thing that's called the book, and you can do all these wonderful book things with it. No, it's, well, we had a scroll, 
and then somebody chops it up and puts it between two covers. And now it's just like a scroll, but it's between these two covers and it's chopped into pieces. <coughs> and then somebody comes up with the page number. And the idea that the page itself is a unit, is a sort of self-contained unit, and you can number it. And then you can point to a particular page number, and you can actually cite by page number. The, the way that the, um, so the text is now indexed. Um, it's now indexed into these units that you can actually locate. You can locate a book on a shelf, and then you can locate a page in the book. And so the uh, page is kind of like this moving window, you know, and everything, it, and it focuses the text. It takes it and it reigns it and it articulates the text. I have this great quote from um, Chappelle and Bringhurst who wrote this book on the, uh, okay, well, it's in here somewhere. Aha. Um, and I won't read this off to you. You can just look at it and, and read it. But uh, the, the point is that um, you get all these, it, it opens up all these possibilities. Something that was made on the model of something old. Something that's just an adaptation of what was previously there and previously unwieldy is first improved just a little bit. And then once you take the step of improving it just a little bit, then you can, with further use, you can improve it a whole lot. All of these minds start to get a hold of the book. All these hands um, start to work with it. And as the book becomes more useful, more people use it. And as more people use it, it becomes more useful, and on and on in this, in this kind of virtuous cycle. And people invent all kinds of things to do with it. They invent um, headers, and they invent marginal notes, and they invent indexes, word indexes. And I mean, you, you, to go from just the page number is one thing, but then to take the page number and to come up with the idea of a word index or concordance that's key to those page numbers, that's a separate thing. And all of this fits and is enabled by the book. <coughs> but these are all a series of discrete ideas that people had that steadily became more popular out of the course of use. Do you see what I'm going with this? Out of the course of use. People didn't look at the book and go, in 100 years, um, what will people want to do with this object? How will they use this technology? And like, how can I uh, lay the groundwork to use this technology? They looked at the book and went, this is pretty cool. Um, I can make little marks down in the, in the corner here and like actually number off the pages. Somebody discovers that. And so anyway, you, you get my point. The other thing that you can do, um, and this is really cool, is you can, you can have marginalia. You can, uh, I don't really know how, I've never used this before. Am I not supposed to look while I go blind? Uh, okay, so these, these things right here. This is, these are marginal notes. This is a, math, a Greek mathematical text. And these are marginal notes. And these are marginal texts. This is a marginal commentary that refers to this stuff right here. This is the source text. These are the marginal notes. Now, this stuff here is not metadata. Um, it's not file metadata. It's conversation. It's... Uh, a better analogy than metadata is that this is the first post, and then you know this is the initial blog entry, and then these are the comments. Seriously, metadata is a poor analogy. Metadata, though, is actually what um, the first digital humanists saw when they looked at marginalia. They said that all this stuff is metadata, but it's not metadata. It's conversation, and it's more than just conversation. It's immortality for whoever it is that's lucky enough to be on this page. And so the page creates a finite space. It creates this kind of, um, this kind of bounded um, uh, arena in which these different voices, these different audible voices that you're reading aloud come into conversation. And the boundaries of the page, um, they, uh, they, they make, they, they create a scarcity. Do you see what I'm saying? They create a scarcity. And <coughs> what you want is to be on the page. Uh, this, is a, this is the text of Homer with uh, marginal commentary. Now, in some cases, the, the, mar the commentary actually, through copyist errors, worked its way, I don't really know if I'm doing anything with this, worked its way into the, uh, into the, into the text itself um, through the course of copying. In some cases, the, uh, the, the commentary um, became more important than the source text and 
uh, not in the case of Homer, obviously, but, but in the case of some of these others, became more important than source text and became something that people um, uh, treasured in its own right, and they put the commentary into separate books. So you can put the commentary into books, um, into separate books. The com you can put the commentary in the margins. The point is that the commentary and the conversation can persist along with the first post. It can persist along with the blog entry or the source text. And not only that, but you can develop a real library system in which you can make a sequence of marginal notes and you can key them to a, a commentary that's in a separate book. And those two books go together. Or you can put the source text up front and you can bind the commentary in the back. The point is that you can put these together and that they persist into perpetuity um, and that you can find them. You can go somewhere and you can actually find the comments that were attached to this digital object. Now, when print comes along, um, this is a, a, a page of early type. This isn't what I wanted. I want a page of early Greek type because you, you won't be able to tell the difference between early Greek type and the actual, um, uh, the, a lot of handwritten script. The point is that when print comes along, the first printed books, just like the scroll is on the copy of the monument, the first printed books are on the copy of the illuminated manuscript. And the first typographers, they didn't invent the font as like a series of um, discrete letters. There were ligatures. They tried to copy handwriting with all the connections. And you can see a few of the ligatures in here. This is, I think, an, um, a UM ligature. Um, you, know, you can see some of these different ligatures in here. And um, some of the places where the, uh, oh, this is a good one. This is AE. Um, so these letters are connected and they're ligatured. And they're connected and they're ligatured because the printed page is a copy of the handwritten page. It's on the model of the handwritten page. But it's cheap. And so the cost per bit starts to go way down as it becomes more popular. I mean, it's not just about the fact that when you print a page, you get exactly, and you get an exact copy. I mean, this was a huge problem with handwriting. Um, people that wrote, um, the, the copying errors were just rampant in antiquity, and you actually didn't trust the, uh, the text that you had in front of you. If you had a text to Homer, the first thing you did was you had to go through, as you were reading it, and spot where you thought the mistakes were. And there was no scientific way of, of figuring out um, this is a mistake, this is not a mistake. You just you would look at this, for instance, this phrase by Agamemnon, you would say, Agamemnon would never say such a thing. This is horrible and, and, and impious, and I'm going to strike this out in my copy because this is what some foolish scribe had put in here. Um, and that's how these copying errors, like you, you, you distrusted the thing that was in front of you because it was copied by hand, it was probably wrong. Um, when you get a, uh, a printed page, the default is to trust that it actually represents what the author intended. Okay, so that's one advantage of it. Another advantage of it, again, is the, is the storage density and the cost per bit. <coughs> now, the cost per bit poses a problem because as things get cheaper and as printing spreads and as it gets more, as it spreads it gets more useful because more people go to work on it. As it gets more useful it spreads and is it, you know, and, and on and on in the virtuous cycle that I mentioned. Um, and that usefulness creates a problem because then there's this explosion of voices. People are still reading aloud. Um, there's this explosion of voices. Everybody has something to say. There's all kinds of things that are being printed. There's, you know, um, um, political tracts and just, you know just anything like story novels and you know junk literature and all kinds of stuff and you get the rise of this um, of, of chaff along with the wheat. So the handwritten books, because they were so expensive, uh, they were fundamentally conservative. Um, this, the scholar's job was really an archival job and you wanted to save things in books. You wanted to save text in books. You wanted to save commentaries in books. With the rise of mass print, then the scholar's job becomes, what do I throw away? What do I leave on the shelf? Um, and the page goes from being something that uh, is a, the, the, the page goes from being a, like a, a conservative, a fundamentally conservative storage meeting that wants to include voices. And it, glows, it, and it turns into something that's pretty exclusive. Now, <coughs> This is a page from my advisor's uh, dissertation. Um, this is the, the printed version of her dissertation. Now, the footnotes, 
start right up here. These are the footnotes. This is the source text. Now, let's talk about this page. Um, I found this with, with Google Print, you know. Um, this is, a, um, and you're not supposed to, you just use screen grab, you're not supposed to be able to copy these. I don't know, maybe she'll sue me. Uh, anyway, uh, so if you are a young scholar, and this is your dissertation on Paul, you have a problem. The problem is that there's 2,000 years of writing on Paul. And the problem is that you come well into the era of print, when people have printed a ton of books on Paul. So you don't want to know everything that's been said. You just want to know what's important. And that's what you have an advisor for. Not only do you just want to know what's important so that you can put it down here, um, this is the stuff right here. Now, now, this book has since gone on to become a fixture in Pauline scholarship. And you, you don't study Paul and you don't study 1 Corinthians without reading this book, especially if you study 1 Corinthians. Um, this, is a, this is a monument, this is a very seminal book. Um, and, but it wasn't like that when it was first printed. This is my point. These were the important voices in this conversation when she first, when she first uh, submitted this, this dissertation for approval at the University of Chicago and when the book was first printed. And this is her up here. And what she wants up here is that in future years and in future times to be down here. You really want to be down here on, in somebody else's book because that's, uh, that's scholarly immortality and it's a personal kind of immortality. It's not a faceless immortality and this is, I mean we can trace this to um, you know, the rise of copyright uh, in, in, the, in the Renaissance and, or actually the Enlightenment and uh, the idea that um, you know, there was this original debate um, with, the, with the rise of printing as to whether an author actually owned their words and whether attribution was important or, you know, whether it was just all going to be free and the information wanted to be free and um, authors couldn't own words. And, and, and the guys that argued for attribution won out. And so then at that point the market takes over. And the need for attribution, the need for, to have my text up here personally attributed to me, to John Stokes, or in this case to Margaret Mitchell, so that one day I can be down here. This becomes a, score, a core scholarly value for these, for these market reasons. And for these physical mediated reasons, this text of the, uh, th this, this footnote space becomes prized real estate because there's so many pages out there. And you really want to show up here. This is, becomes a kind of scholarly Valhalla where you know you go and you're locked in a mortal combat, you know if you're if you're really a virtuous scholarly warrior, then you get to go on to Valhalla and you and you 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 live to fight again for eternity um, <coughs> in the pages of the footnotes and to argue and to go back and forth with your fellow scholars. And um, if you if you actually if you think about the web, you can think about where I'm going with this. And so I've identified these two values in this kind of like whirlwind nickel tour of um, the history of scholarship and media. I've, I've identified these two values um, that scholars want. They want persistence. They want their words to persist. They want to be able to attach their words to sources. And they want those words to persist as part of conversation. Two, they want attribution. They want people to know who they are, right? So you want persistence and you want attribution. And what happens is that the web frustrates these things. Um, the online realm frustrates these things because because it's so easy to copy, it's easy to forge. Um, if you think about the perspective of a scholar today, um, do you want to start a blog if you're in the humanities? Well, no you do not, especially if you're um, pre-tenure. The reason that you don't want to start a blog and join this online conversation is that um, you have to put time and effort into you know, effort, effort and attention are a scarce resource in the information age. You have to put time and effort into that blog post. You don't know if that blog post is going to be here in 100 years, if people will be able to find it in 100 years. You don't know if the server will still be around. You don't know if the blog post is going to have your name on it, or will somebody come across the dude that ripped you off and like reposted it under his name or something like this. And so it doesn't make any sense for you as somebody who wants to show up here in this, in this rarefied, um, valued, precious real estate to just put your words on a page with no margins. 
because the, the web page doesn't have any margins, or, or rather it has infinite margins. I mean, it's the same thing, basically, whether it has infinite margins or no margins. <coughs> and scholars are ultimately craftspeople. They, they take um, the tools that they have. Um, now, Margaret Mitchell, I think, wrote this in Nota Bene, and she still uses Nota Bene, um, which is a really old uh, humanities word processor from the 80s. Um, I tried to talk her into Melel, which is very good uh, um, uh, humanities uh, Mac uh, thing, but uh, Mac word processor. But anyway, um, the point is that you, you learn a set of tools, um, whether it's a word processor, whether it's a typewriter, um, whatever set of tools it is that you've invested in learning. You learn a set of library tools. You learn to use a specific set of indexes. You learn to use a set of journal articles, articles a card catalog, an online interface. And then you make this stuff. You make these arguments with the tools that you know how to use as a sort of craftsperson, just the way that a person builds a boat or a ship based on the previous models that have come before. And that's why um, scholarship is fundamentally technologically conservative and it's fundamentally locked um, within the page. Because if you, if you don't have this page to circumscribe, the page focuses. The page is like a lens that zooms in on the one needle in this conversational haystack that you care about. Well, um, let me back up a bit. So if, I, don't, I only have 10 minutes. Uh, you only have to suffer for 10 minutes more. So uh, if the, um, now if scholarship is mediated conversation, if it's people talking in and to each other through media, then what does that say about the rise of blogging and is the social web? Um, before five years ago, say, could you really imagine all of these thousands of people talking about foreign policy and theology and um, talking about all these things with a very, a very high degree of, um, of sophistication and of erudition, <coughs> could you have imagined them doing this in a, in a textual context, in a textual context that's public? I'm not talking about email or private letters. I'm talking about arguing on the public record. And this is blog conversation. You know, this is blog conversation. This is um, message board conversation. You're, all these people are now arguing about all these important things on the public record. And they're, it's a fundamentally different culture because you don't really care who copies you. You care that the ideas go out there. But um, that world of posting things to the internet, typing things onto the web, and you know, letting it go, and this world of something that's carefully curated and bounded and focused and has this institutional, um, uh, th this institution behind it that decides and that adjudicates um, which of the voices bubble up to the top and that decides if this voice up here gets to go back down into the footnotes in the next round. Um, all of these, uh, the, the guilds and the tenure committees and stuff that do all of these things depend on this, on the finitude of the page. They depend uh, for their livelihood on the finitude of the page. And they depend on the persistence and the positive attribution um, that that finitude gives you and that, those, that the, the book media gives you. <coughs> now, let me, um, let me go back and talk a little bit about the problem with um, just doing, um, like for instance, a digital humanities archive. Um, so now we're at the phase where we've taken all of these old texts and we've scanned them. Like this is a page from the Goodspeed Manuscript Scanning Project. And by itself, it's not very interesting. Uh, it's just a really high, res, really high res scan. And you put it online, um, the interface is clunky, and the problems with this are that for one, um, it's not going to show up in a Google image search. And that's a real problem. You have to know to go to the Goodspeed Manuscript Collection and click on the link and go into this and go into the Zoomify interface that they, that they licensed. <coughs> um, I should have had a, a screen cap of the actual interface that you navigate with. But it, the problem isn't just that it's hard to use and that it's clunky. Um, the other problem is that there's no place for me to attach a piece of conversation to this digital representation of this manuscript. 
if I want to talk about this manuscript and know that a student in 100 years can read it, I still have to go through um, the print publishing apparatus and you know, have, um, have uh, the, uh, the, the powers that be decide that like, you know, I can publish in this journal and then that journal sits on a library shelf. But um, there's no way to, to, to start with this, to start with this, this thing this uh, digital representation of this object, and then first to attach a comment to it. To know that the comment is going to be there, to know that it can be positively identified as your comment. And to know that um, at some point uh, the comments are going to flow out from this and that a future scholar will be able to start with a digital representation of the object and will be able to trace those threads of conversation and find um, my voice or find the voice of my advisor, or find you know, the voice of somebody besides you know, James Dobson, you know, if he has some, something to say about this, which you know, who knows, he may, um, or Pat Robertson, or whoever. So, <coughs> or just some random guy online. So, um, so this, is, this is one issue. Um, and the reason for this, the, the reason that things are this way is kind of complicated, but, um, there's this kind of, so I, I've actually talked about the technological reasons. There's no, um, there's no like mechanism, like internet-wide mechanism for like positive identification. You know, it's like um, there's passport, there's open ID, um, you know, there's your email account or your credit card number. But on the internet in general, out there in the wild of the internet, um, there's no way to really verify who I am. And so that's a problem. And that's why, um, that's why scholars are going to continue to stick to the printed page. That's one reason. You know, another problem that's being solved, actually, is the persistence problem. Google Groups, for instance, that's, that's persistent. I think that that will probably be around a long time from now. Um, you know, Yahoo Groups, Microsoft Groups, those things will be accessible. Um, so the persistence problem is something that is being worked on. The identification problem is uh, it's much deeper. And you can do different federated ID things and stuff like this. But, um, I, and, I, and I'll tell you uh, uh, my, my proposed solution for, for some of this in a moment. But um, what you wind up with is uh, you make an, a digital archive, you put these objects in the archive, you want them hosted on your server at your school because your school has to be important, it has to be a key player. Um, and you want your people and your CS department to structure the metadata for it. And you want, to, you, you want as much of, um, it's the NIH syndrome, it's the non invented here syndrome. You want to be as deeply involved as you can with this. What you don't want to do is scan this and then just like let it go and people forget that it ever came from the University of Chicago or that you know, we were ever involved with it. And so <coughs> you also, so you want to make a digital archive, you want to host it yourself, you want to come up with all the different commenting apparatus and all this other kind of stuff yourself. You want, to, you want to roll the whole thing yourself so that you get all the credit. And so that one day, um, 10 years in the future, when everybody does things your way, um, then you are the, 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 the people that revolutionized the way that we look at digital objects. Because that's what, that's what humanists do. Um, humanity scholars, they swing for the fences. They want to be um, the guy that nobody reads Plato the same way after, uh, after Eric Havelock, you know. Um, nobody reads um, Paul the same way after Margaret Mitchell. You know, you always want to revolutionize something. And so <coughs> there's, this, um, there's this instinct to, like, keep all of the eggs, um, you know, in, in your nest and not, not to let this stuff get out. Um, the problem, then, is that... Uh, You need, to, you need people to use it. And for people to use it, it has to be user friendly. And there have to be uh, features. Um, and so people have to, you have to, you have to get, I, I described this, um, I described this, uh, this kind of um, uh, virtuous circle a couple of times in which people start to use something. Then as they use it, they, they have a feature request that comes from the user base. And then that gets, that gets added. And then they use that feature, or maybe they reject it, and another feature gets added. And so the whole thing kind of evolves into something totally new, sort of like Google Maps is a good example. 
Um, you know, it starts out in this really nice state. Actually, you know, it has a predecessor in, in, in Yahoo Maps, and so then you have Google Maps, and it does a few new things that Yahoo Maps didn't do. And then it continues to get capabilities over the course of use. Over the course of use is the point. It's not that you build this, you put it on the internet, it's totally unusable, um, it's a pain to use, and then you imagine a set of features that people might want at some point in the future. Um, you know, that's, the, that's kind of the current model of how, of how we do things in the digital humanities. You put it on the internet, you imagine an ideal feature set, and you try to build that, or you hope that somebody will build it, or you publish an article describing that feature set that you will one day build when the programmers come from the heavens and code this feature set. And this is the other problem, the missing programmers. Um, programmers code for two reasons. One is because they get paid, and two is, uh, Eric S. Raymond has famously said, to scratch an itch. Um, you know, you code, if you code in uh, open source software, you code to scratch an itch. You code because, like, um, you're solving a problem that maybe is your problem or that's a collective problem. Um, programmers don't have the same itches that humanists have. And this is why digital humanities projects don't have features. Um, you know, humanists don't have money, and we don't have the same itches as coders. And so the coders never come, and the features never come. And so what you end up with are papers that are written in the technological subjunctive, um, with, with I started the talk. Things that users should be able to do, um, could be able to do, ought to be able to do, uh, users need to be able to do, should be able to do, they ought to be able to do this, that, and the other. Um, <coughs> I don't really expect you to read this whole thing. Our uh, dictionaries should be able to search new text for varying senses, claim for each word. Encyclopedias should scan. Um, text should collate themselves. All this stuff should happen automat automatically in the year 2000 um, when the programmers come and the programmers implement all of these features that we cannot pay for, um, and, and, or that we won't pay them for. Do um, you see what I'm saying? And, and it comes from this notion of, uh, of uh, technological evolution as somehow inevitable, that I've been trying to chip away at, at this talk in this very, very disorganized fashion, and my apologies, um, but because I had so much material. But um, uh, the, the notion that um, technology evolves on its own, that's what's driving this kind of talk. The notion that somehow um, these features are going to emerge um, because they're inevitable, because they're just so cool. Like it would be, it would be so cool if text would all collate themselves against each other. Um, and, and, and the collation is a, um, it's a comparison where you, it's basically a diff um, for you Unix guys. Um, diff is a kind of a collation tool. So, <laughs> you know, it would be cool if all this stuff would happen. It would be really cool. It would be so cool that it has to happen eventually. But it doesn't have to happen. It doesn't have to happen if there's no money for it to happen. It doesn't have to happen if um, uh, the user base is separate from the base of people that are, can actually make it happen. And this is another point that, I'm, that I want to make about technological evolution, about the book, and about the scroll. All these innovations were driven from the people that had these objects in their hands. They used them daily, um, and eventually a light bulb would come on in one person's head, and they would contribute to that. They would contribute themselves. They would contribute a page number. They would contribute an index. Um, they would contribute a footnote. And these contributions worked themselves out over the course of centuries with certain physical constraints in mind. They affected the conversation. They affected the nature of the conversation. And that's the way that um, <coughs> the thing sort of moved forward. It wasn't that somebody, a man had a vision, you know, a guy had a vision for how people would conversate and how they would store information, how they would store text, how they would write, and then eventually someone came along and implemented that vision. Um, it was that these things evolved in the course of use, but people that use digital objects in the humanities, that use manuscript scans, they don't code, and so they can't think of a feature and make that feature happen. They're not prepared to implement it themselves. They don't have money to pay somebody to implement it, and 
the guys that do know how to implement it don't care about these features enough to do it. Do you see what I'm saying? And so there's, it's actually, um, the, the problem comes down to a, 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 problem of, a, a problem of conception and a problem of language, a problem of thinking about what technology is. And is technology something that evolves under its own steam? Well, no, it doesn't evolve under its own steam. It really does grow from use. Now, I, I guess I should try and apply that somehow to you guys in the audience because I'm sort of talking about this field that's esoteric and that you, know, you probably will not participate in. And it's also the case that um, for you in the audience, if you want to work at a startup and <coughs> you want to make lots and lots of money like the people at VMware or other people at Google, then, you, th th then I'm not talking to you because you're not going to make lots and lots of money by just building a slightly better mousetrap. You're going to build lots and lots of money by, you're going to make lots and lots of money by doing what I said that digital humanists shouldn't do, which is swing for the fences. Think three years out, think about what it is that people are going to be doing in three years and like how it is that you're going to make that happen. Uh, you know, actually let me, let me back up. That's one way to make lots and lots of money. You can actually make lots and lots of money, I think, by building a better mousetrap and accidentally um, hitting it out of the park, you know, like the Napster guy. You know, this guy just wanted to find a way to, um, to steal music, you know, to, uh, to, uh, to, share, to share music with his friends and such. And so he, he, he coded this application and, um, and it, was, uh, it, it took off and it was a hit, you know. At, at any rate, so these are, um, I, I hope that I've made a, a kind of a larger point about exactly what is wrong with all digi digital humanities projects and why everybody should listen to me. And let me finish out, um, because I'm going five minutes over, with, um, with uh, if I were king of the world, based on all this random stuff that I've just kind of spewed out here. Um, if I were king of the world, I would go to uh, Jeff Bezos at Amazon and I would say, this network called the Nines has 175,000 and counting digital objects. Take these from us, monetize them, sell ads on them, do whatever it is that you want to do with them. Just make sure that they're available and freely accessible. Make sure that the values of persistence and attribution are respected. <coughs> make sure that when people post comments that you know, you know that that's their real name, just like you can verify that that's somebody's real name you know, on Amazon. Um, and build a set of APIs or an information architecture around these the way that you did with S3 so that people can make mashups with these objects. Um, I would go to Sergey and Larry at Google and I would tell them the same thing. I would say take all of these objects that we're producing in libraries, all these things that we're scanning, take them, host them, and expose uh, this conversational functionality. Um, make a set of APIs make a way that we can attach conversation to these objects, that they're going to persist, that the conversation is going to persist, and it's going to be uniquely and positively identifiable, my contribution, your contribution, and it'll be around in 100 years. Um, I would go to uh, Bill Gates at Microsoft, and I would say the, the service computing thing is really cool. Give me one, and give me two or three programmers, and we will make an interface for interacting with um, these, uh, these manuscript scans that doesn't stink. And that's intuitive like the iPhone interface is intuitive, a multi-touch interface. And an interface that you can use to attach comments, that you can use to mark things up, that you can use to mark up this page, and that you can use to leave your notes on this page and expose your notes and expose the notes of other people's. And if you did this, you know, it would sell. You could monetize it. You could put one in every research library in the country. The point is to work with the market because the market will actually tell you what's successful. Again, you take a model um, from the market, um, like <coughs> actually the service computing thing isn't really from the market. It's, it's a prototype at any rate. You take something that someone has done, a blog model, um, some kind of conversational media model, and you adapt it for scholarly purposes. And that becomes the new classic that the craftsman works on and tweaks and, and that we adapt. Um, I'm going to go ahead and shut it off here because uh, I don't want to ramble anymore. But I'll open up the floor for, for any questions that you guys have about anything that I've just said. And um, I, we have about five, ten minutes. Um, 
if anyone has any comments, questions. Okay, I'll, I'll just take it that everybody's mind is just blown. Your minds are just blown. Sir. Sure. No longer is the craftsman the person creating the tools, that with the improvement of the scroll to the book, it was the person using the scroll that was also crafting the scroll right. and involved. Now the production of these tools is completely divorced from the craftsman using them in the case of the humanities scholar. Exactly. So the, the technician, the craftsman who builds the tools, has no knowledge of the humanities needs. And the humanities, having said, we don't want to be part of these technical guys, has no skills to be crafting anymore. So almost anything that's crafted isn't going to be fitting their needs because of that divorce. Right. This is, this is the kind of point of, of, given, of, of my suggestion to give these things to private companies that have been very successful at making information and uh, not just making information available and persistent, but like making Google and Amazon with the book scanning projects are two people, two groups that have made um, physical objects available online for people to put comments on. Do you see what I'm saying? And so my suggestion is to, is to give these objects to them for them to put online and for them to let people put comments on. And then scholars can go and they use these just the same way that they use Amazon regularly, that they use Google regularly. You see what I'm saying? So yeah, you're right. Um, scholars are going to do what they, what they know how to do with the tools that they have. The tools that they know how to use are Amazon. You know, they know how to work the Amazon comment system. Um, and so this is kind of my point. It's that you, you really have to think outside the box and you have to, to get out of this walled garden thing and, and be willing to let these objects go in the digital realm and to let people monetize them and sell ads on them um, as long as they're freely accessible. And then instead of um, using a scroll, you know, um, which is something that you know, you're using the Amazon comment system or you're using um, Google Groups or something like this, an interface that you know. Because every time you try to learn to use a digital archive, the Perseus project, the Rossetti project, you have to invest. You have to invest um, time into learning to use one of these tools. And you don't know if the interface is going to change. You don't know if that time is a good investment. You don't know up front if that time is a good investment. You don't know what you're going to get out of the nines. You don't know what you're going to get out of the Perseus project. Um, and so if you sit down and you invest a lot of time in learning to use it, um, is it going to be there? Is it going to change? And how many of these tools am I going to invest my time in? If there's like 500 different kind of cool and revolutionary things that people have cooked up to do with ancient texts online, I'm only going to learn to use three or four of them. Like really, you know, I'm not going to go out and learn to use all of this stuff. You know, so there's a, there's a usage barrier. Um, and again, this is the point of just using, using commodity stuff, using stuff that's already out there, models that are already successful. Anyway, yeah. What? So it seems that Wikipedia seems to have a format that works pretty well for this. I mean, you can upload pictures, you can place your own articles. What, what, what else would be wrong with Wikipedia that, I mean, that it doesn't already do, that um, you would expect it to? Hmm. Well, uh, I mean, aside from the fact that um, you, you have all these yahoos on Wikipedia that just uh, um, deface articles and, uh, um, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I mean, I guess what I would say, nothing's wrong with it, you know? We should give it a shot. I mean, Wikipedia is a good idea. I just, I thought of Microsoft and Google and, uh, and Amazon off the top of my head. But, you know, Wikipedia, that might be a good model. Now, I mean, that Wikipedia has some institutional problems because what cannot happen, what can never happen, is that um, a, a tenured professor at like a real university um, edits the page and then some, some uh, wacko um, somewhere like rolls it back and like puts in something crazy, you know what I'm saying? And like that, that's, that's totally antithetical um, to the point. <coughs> so I guess like, yeah, there's, there's ways that, but you're, you're, you're right. You, there are ways that you could adapt or that one could adapt Wikipedia um, to, uh, and, and adapt that model and interface model to the digital humanities. That's definitely, I mean, that's, you know, that's definitely a good idea. Anyone else?
the oligarchy. <laughs> well, I mean, if you, um, I, I think that, that, that the production of quality conversation um, it's always going to be, there's always going to be a master-disciple relationship in there. There's always going to be a guy that's a black belt at it and a guy that's a yellow belt. And the guy that's the black belt has to train the yellow belt, you know, un until he's at his level. And so it's always going to be a case where you have to have the black belts and the high rankers steering all of the, um, you know, and training all these people on how to, how to talk about stuff, how to think about stuff. You know what I'm saying? And that's a top-down model. That's a hierarchical model. And that's, that's going to persist, I think, in scholarship. Um, and, it, and it happens online, too. It happens like, I mean, ours seems like an oligarchy, but we started with a copy of Front Page 98. Um, you know, we, we knew how to use Front Page 98. This is a tool that we knew. And we began to publish online with it in uh, 1998, in August of 98. And we, uh, we produced the best conversation and the best commentary that we could. And in the course of use, <coughs> um, we began to be able to monetize it, and we began to be able to build it up. And it became what it is today. Um, but, you know, it's not what it's going to be tomorrow. Um, as we continue to use it, we'll continue to evolve it. But, um, yeah, it's, it, it, and we take people in, and we train them to think like us, and to talk like us, and to look at a story the way that we look at a story. And when you see an article appear on the front page of Ars Technica, um, Typically, now this doesn't always happen because we have editorial breakdowns, but typically that article is the product of a lot of people in a chat room banging on it and kicking the tires and telling this guy, you didn't chase down this lead, you didn't chase down this story. And so it's a product of training. You see what I'm saying? It's a product of the senior people telling the younger people what to think and how to think um, so that they produce the right kind of object as a result of their craft. Anyone else? I, oh, oh, I guess we are, we're out of time. Oh. Thank you. Excellent. <laughs>